So if you're dealing with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, or EPI, like all the cool kids call it, it was over on our video for pancreatic insufficiency that user Kirlak said, what about the connection between SIBO and EPI? And we hear a lot about that. And in the description below this video, I'll share this link to this study on factors that affect the prevalence of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in chronic pancreatitis and some other studies that'll help us understand that there's a strong association between these two. And my viewpoint is that when we're looking at pancreatitis and exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, that they really are not the same things. The pancreatitis is all about inflammation here in the pancreas and the pancreatic insufficiency is about you know enzymes not being delivered down here to help us digest our food correctly. But my viewpoint is that in a lot of cases, the pancreatitis is just what can happen a few steps later when these enzymes are not being delivered. And so I explain that a little bit more on our video on why do I have pancreatitis, and I'll put the link to that in the description below. I just want you to understand why that some of these studies that we're going to look at are looking like at pancreatitis, but then they'll also mention EPI as well. So when we're looking at symptoms that go along with this EPI, and some of them can be really lousy. So if you're dealing with this, I understand that the situation is not super fun. But we see symptoms like oily diarrhea, steatorrhea, and this is one that I want you to remember. Steatorrhea is just when we see like a light colored diarrhea type situation that is usually oily. Like you see a lot of undigested fats in there. That's going to be important. We also see bloating and gas and fatigue and cramps and pain in the stomach. We see a loss of muscle along with muscle cramps and we see a lot of vitamin deficiencies. And what's interesting is that when you look up the symptoms for SIBO, you're going to see a lot of those same symptoms. But when I'm looking at associations, I like to look a lot deeper than that. So just keep in mind that I'm not a doctor. I'm not giving anybody medical advice. I'm just a schmuck stand-up comic turned nutrition author because when I lost my voice for eight years, 23 doctors were not able to help me get any answers and I had to dig for my own answers. So now I teach the things that I learned in my books and courses and help people understand how to look at the underlying causes of issues. But when we're looking at this pancreatic insufficiency, we need to understand the digestive process a little bit before we can understand the association with SIBO. And I'm not going to go into a lot of the studies and the medical literature that I reference when I explain this real quick. I'll put the link to that pancreatic insufficiency video below so you can dig into that next if you want to go deeper into the science of this. But here's what we need to understand really quick is that when we eat food, the stomach makes hydrochloric acid to help acidify the food and then the food comes down here and then that triggers this gallbladder to squirt this bile down to help us emulsify the dietary fats and access fat soluble vitamins and stuff like that and coming into here also triggers the pancreas to squirt out bicarb that also helps us neutralize the acid stuff coming from the stomach and it also squirts out the enzymes so it's all of these processes together that really help us digest our food correctly so what's responsible for that is a hormone called cholecystokinin that's here in the duodenum area this duodenum is like the first 10 inches of the small intestine so when these things come down here, that cholecystokinin is what triggers the gallbladder to squirt the bile down. And the cholecystokinin also triggers the pancreas to squirt out the bicarbs and the enzymes. So when we're seeing malfunctions, the medical world really just likes to blame the organ. Ah, stupid organ isn't doing what it's supposed to do. We never stop to think, well, what about what's supposed to trigger those organs to kick into action? And this cholecystokinin triggering these things into action is something that we learn in like high school biology. Like if you have a high school student in your house, you can just ask, well you can't ask them because a the high school student's not going to talk to you, but you could text them, you could send them a text and they'll usually text you back and they'll be like, yeah, I learned about that in Mr. Woodward's AP biology class. Mr. Woodward's also the one who told me to get a haircut in front of the whole class. He's trying to ruin my life just like you are. Okay, love you. But this is not new information. This is stuff that we've known for a very long time. So when we're looking at what's creating malfunctions here, we want to think about, well, is there a problem in the signal 
that's supposed to tell the pancreas to send those enzymes out there. So here's a really big piece of information that we're going to talk about when we get to this SIBO part, and that's that this cholecystokinin here in the duodenum is triggered by stomach acid. It's the stomach acid coming down here into the duodenum that tells the cholecystokinin, hey, it's time to tell the gallbladder to drop this stuff down there, and it's time to tell the pancreas to squirt this stuff out there. So I go over some papers that explain that cholecystokinin is triggered by either stomach acid or amino acids or fatty acids from the dietary fats that we consume. But a lot of people today are running in horror from dietary fat like we thought was bad for us in the 80s, and they're not eating a lot of fats enough to trigger that cholecystokinin. And it's very common today for someone not to be making enough stomach acid for a wide variety of reasons. So the thing is, we need stomach acid to break down protein into amino acids. So this cholecystokinin is sitting here waiting for either stomach acid or amino acids to tell it to kick in, or maybe some dietary fat. But the biggest trigger seems to be the stomach acid. So if someone's not making enough stomach acid, it's not really triggering it. So the pancreas is like, hey, I'm going to do such a great job, but it's never told to do its job. It's never kicked into action if this cholecystokinin is not being triggered. It's also important to understand that this stomach acid is not just here to help us acidify the food so that we can break the food down and get the nutrients out of that food. It's the barrier to the whole digestive system. It's supposed to fry these bad guys that come in on the food that we're eating. They should die in an acid bath. So when that's not there, we're also not killing off all these microorganisms that come in on the food that we're eating. So this lack of stomach acid is called hypochlorhydria. And we see here on this medical website that hypochlorhydria is a deficiency of stomach acid. If you don't have enough stomach acid, you can't digest food properly or absorb its nutrients. This leads to indigestion, malnutrition, and sometimes bacterial overgrowth. We can also look at this study on proton pump inhibitor induced gut dysbiosis and immunomodulization, current knowledge and potential restoration by probiotics. And they say that PPIs change the composition of gut microbiota by, among other things, altering pH and affecting the modulation of the immune response. In addition, many studies show that long-term use of PPIs may be associated with serious side effects, including SIBO and intestinal infections. So, I've shared a lot of different studies and a lot of different videos about having a lack of stomach acid has the ability to open the front door so the bad guys can come in. So a PPI is showing here in this study to have the ability to allow bad guys in, but a person doesn't need to be on a PPI or a proton pump inhibitor. It's basically an acid reflux medication that's used to turn off stomach acid to relieve that symptom of acid coming back up. But a person could have no stomach acid or very low stomach acid for a lot of different reasons. They don't need to be on a PPI. And in that other video, I shared this study on associations with pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, and they were looking at different things that could be associated with this. And one thing they looked at was PPI use. And they said that PPI therapy doubled the odds of pancreatic exocrine insufficiency after the adjustments of everything else that we're looking in here. So they're also understanding that lowering the stomach acid has the ability to magnify this pancreatic insufficiency issue. And what's interesting about this is that the main treatments for exocrine pancreatic insufficiency is to supply the body with enzymes. Well, the pancreas isn't delivering them at all, so we're just going to give you some enzymes and that'll go in and help you digest and break down that food a little bit better to get more of the nutrients and relieve some of these symptoms over here. And I'm okay with that. That makes sense. Give the body more enzymes when they're not making enough. We do that with a lot of clients. As we age, we kind of produce a little bit less. But the other main treatment that is used for this is PPIs to turn off stomach acid. I feel like you're waiting for me to tell you why that's a good idea. I, I don't really have anything for you. They say that, well, some of these enzymes get destroyed in acid and they don't make it down to the small intestine where they can really help you digest that food. So we'll just turn off stomach acid more and then those enzymes can get through and those enzymes can help you do that. And if you're looking at this with common sense, with common sense, you might tell me, hey, Tony, why wouldn't we just fix the stomach acid issue, help them acidify the food correctly, and maybe that acid would keep out all the bad guys so we don't have a SIBO issue, and then that acid would come down here 
activate the cholecystokinin, whose job is to trigger this gallbladder to put down the bile and trigger the pancreas to squirt out the bicarb and all the enzymes. And then we really get all of the activities digesting our food correctly. Tony, wouldn't that be a good idea? Well, I don't know. You know, when you're telling me that, you're just using common sense. Common sense is not always allowed when we're looking at health topics. Let's look a little bit further into this study that talks about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is common in chronic pancreatitis. And they're talking about the true prevalence of SIBO with these pancreatic dysfunction issues. It's kind of hard to tell because there's different ways to test SIBO. And since there's different ways to test, we can't really firm up if SEMO is really gonna go along with pancreatic insufficiency and pancreatitis or not. And this one also goes on to say, unfortunately, treatment options in CP are limited and palliative. Palliative just means that we're just gonna try to make the person feel better without addressing the underlying cause. That's the definition when you look up palliative. Uh, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy is the most common therapy for these issues associated with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. In EPI, this replacement of enzymes improves digestive symptoms, nutrition, bone health, glycemic control, and health-related quality of life. And it's doing that because we're looking at this ability to kind of help the body access a little bit more nutrients from the food. And that's what enzymes can do. But enzymes are just a part of that digestive process. So the person is really just getting a little bit of boost by increasing their enzyme intake. So they go on to say, steatorrhea, however, often responds only partially to PERT. Initial management steps include assessing adherence to PERT. Is the client really using the enzymes like we're telling them to? They might ingesting PERT throughout the meal, increasing the dose, and then adding co-treatment like H2 blockers or PPIs. Persistent steatorrhea, despite addressing these factors, may indicate an alternate cause of diarrhea or malabsorption, which is most commonly due to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So they're saying that when my enzymes that I give them doesn't work, and when I also turn off stomach acid all the way, so the enzymes can work a little bit better, if this steatorrhea and diarrhea issue still persists, it must be due to the SIBO. And that line of thinking just kind of reminds me of my five-year-old explaining why all grown-ups don't get along. Well, Daddy, not all grown-ups have seen K-pop demon hunters. And if you haven't seen K-pop demon hunters, then you can't talk about K-pop demon hunters. And you can't even sing all the songs from K-pop demon hunters. So if all the grown-ups saw K-pop demon hunters, I think the grown-ups would get along better. And yeah, honey, I can see how you got there, but I'm not sure that's really the reason why all grown-ups don't get along. So I can see how they got here, but when we're looking at this steatorrhea here, remember that this is gonna be a, a diarrhea that's light in color, and it's gonna be oily and have undigested fats in it. Well, the gallbladder has this bile that it squirts down, and bile is this green color, and that's what colors our stool and makes it a darker color. The bile also helps us emulsify or digest and break down dietary fats. So when you can digest fats correctly, they're not gonna end up in your stool and make a oily stool. So remember again, the gallbladder is also being triggered by this cholecystokinin, just like the pancreas is. The problem is the main player in telling the cholecystokinin to get into action is the stomach acid. So we're told that enzymes really only are effective on partially digested food. So food that's already started to break down by acidifying, having this bile and the bicarb, the opposite pH is meeting to really help us bust that food apart and into these smaller nutrients that the enzymes can really get nutrients out of. So there's a chain of events that has to happen in this digestive process. And if the first step, the stomach acid, is not happening, why would the next chain happen? Why would the other things take place if the first trigger didn't tell the other things to take place? So if you're dealing with this issue, using some enzymes can be really great. That can give you a little bit of a boost uh, immediately just by at least giving your digestion a little bit more oomph. But we really need to fix digestive malfunctions that are going on. A lot of times this bile has become too thick and sticky to flow correctly and we need to take steps to thin that out. But improving this low stomach acid issue is really crucial. But here's what's important to understand that fixing low stomach acid can help the pancreas get triggered into action. We hear from people all the time that have had success with that. 
but just increasing stomach acid is not going to fix this SIBO issue. A person is going to have to take more steps to kind of wipe out any type of overgrowth that has come down here into the small intestine. So additional steps will need to be taken to correct that. And one problem is that a lot of times, you know, if somebody's going to acidify using like betaine HCL capsules, and we talk about that in a lot of other videos, but if they do that when there's an overgrowth, either in the stomach or the small intestine, it has the ability to kind of magnify some symptoms at first. So a person might need to take steps to reduce that overgrowth before they can really start acidifying that stomach. And if you don't know how to do any of these things, we'll put a link in the description below for our totally free digestion course. And that'll just walk you through the process of figuring out, you know, which aspects of digestion are not working and what steps will really help you improve those. But my feeble common sense opinion only is it's just opinion is that SIBO is not causing the pancreas to, to malfunction and the, the pancreas is not causing the SIBO just because it's malfunctioning. It's just they both have the ability to have the same underlying cause, which can be a lack of stomach acid. And other things can really contribute to SIBO as well, but that's a pretty good way to start it off, is just to leave the front door open and tell everybody there's a good cake party inside. So I view these as things that are seen together, but not necessarily caused by each other. Now, if you wanna dig into this pancreatic insufficiency a little bit more and look at all the studies that I shared about all of that, then you can jump over right now and check out our video on pancreatic insufficiency. But if you feel like you might have low stomach acid, you could also check out our video on 10 signs of low stomach acid to gain more insights if that may really be a problem for you or not. I can't wait to hear about your results.